So now uh, let's uh, uh, recap what we did today. We uh, built the uh, IoT robot that is an expert sniper. It's going to do very bad things. So maybe we need to step back just one, and, uh, one, one step or two and uh, think a little bit beyond just like uh, technological aspects. And in this context, Vesna, um, who works for Ripe, is going to give us a few examples, uh, concrete examples of moral dilemma in uh, uh, technology uh, development and also more general considerations on, on uh, ethics in this context. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to use this mic. Um, or maybe not, because I don't see my slides on the screen. So let's see how this is going to work. Okay, let's see. Let's see if it works. Yeah, sure. So why uh, why yin yang a symbol that uh, I start my presentation with? Well, um, I used to be a, a techno optimist. I used to believe that the technology and science and the internet are going to make the world a better place. And that was about 25 years ago when I started studying electrical engineering and I discovered the internet and I thought, oh, when we just connect all the people to each other, we'll increase the understanding and um, you know, bring the education and uh, bring democracy everywhere and we'll get this uh, technical technological utopia. And then about five years ago, I, I, I kind of switched sides and I thought, wait a minute, are we actually the good guys? And then I found myself in this kind of black part of this yin-yang system and I kind of became a technical pessimist, technological pessimist, like, oh my God, what did we do when we created the internet? And, uh, and then uh, I start, kind of started to look into this gray area between these two extremes of optimism and pessimism. So, uh, and that brought me to, to study the ethics, which is the science of the values. And so this kind of border between the, the black and, and white area is what I want to talk about. So how do we determine what is a good thing and what is a bad thing and how, how can we make the good things happen and prevent bad things from happening? So. I, I listened to the presentations in the uh, second half of today and they were very technically detailed and mine is not going to be like that. So I'm going to talk about ethics and technology on a very high level and I am going to use a concrete example of the existing product called Ripe Atlas, which is kind of Internet of Things device. And uh, although my background is in uh, computer science, I don't do that anymore. I'm a community builder at uh, Ripe NCC. So I'll uh, cover these things here, and uh, this is going to be a short version of the talk that I gave several times this year and last year. And if you want a longer version, you can see the one from the hackers camp that happened uh, last summer. So, okay, so these are the texts that you should read if you want to get more details. Especially I recommend that the, for the people who are into crypto, the moral character of uh, cryptographic work that's really, really amazing, and so please read it. So, a Wikipedia page about ethics, so it's a science, it's a philosophical science about good and evil, uh, about responsibilities that we have for uh, our work, and we can think of, of that in the normal life, like, is it good to steal, in which situation is it actually not evil to steal from somebody, we can consider it in sciences, like, in, in uh, general sciences like uh, biology and medicine, and we can consider it for the technical sciences, so for engineering and for the computer science. So we cannot claim anymore that technology is neutral because technology is embedded in our daily life. And so the decisions that we as engineers make have impact not only on us, but they have the impact on well, civilians or the regular people. And so we have to take these ethical considerations uh, when we are building our technological systems. And uh, specifically, we have to look into the power imbalances 
and to see if, are our technologies actually perpetuating the existing power structures or are they trying to change the power structures and who benefits from the technologies that we are building. So we are not the first ones to actually um, encounter these dilemmas. These ethical dilemmas uh, were um, um, the people who were facing these dilemmas also had to work on the atomic bomb and they had to, like the medical uh, scientists, they had to take this ethical oath and also the environmental scientists uh, were changed when they realized what are they actually creating in the world and other computer scientists also had to think about previously, like before the internet, uh, what are the consequences of the technologies that we are inventing and how can they be misused uh, or, or if we didn't think of the proper usages. And so I want to use the example of internet measurement as some kind of use case for the computer science in general. And also because there was a, a multidisciplinary group of people who actually studied all this and, uh, and summarized it uh, in a very nice way, so I just kind of borrowed their work. And so they looked into applied ethics and they thought, okay, so if we do want to consider the ethical questions, what kind of criteria do we have to use? Well, the ethics is actually quite a large science, so there is all kinds of different criteria that you can consider for yourself. And then before you start with your computer science project, you have to choose like which one it is. And so because this is a really short talk, I'm not going to go uh, through this and it's also very theoretical. So the bottom line is you have to use a combination of these and you have to ask yourself like how is this applicable for my work? So either case to case or which principles you're going to follow and <coughs> The, the, the least applicable one is, is it, is it actually just useful for my research? And it doesn't matter uh, what kind of means I use to reach those ends. And so uh, this uh, document was created by both technologists and the philosophers. And they considered the internet as a social technical system. So these are their guidelines basically on a, on a very high level. So uh, we as, as, as engineers, uh, scientists and geeks in general, um, some of us from like the early age thought, oh my God, we are like the uh, smartest kid in the class and we are bullied because we are not so cool and we don't really have any power. <coughs> but nowadays, the world has changed, so the geeks actually do have a lot of power and we have to take the responsibility that comes with that power and then consider the, the users of this technology to actually not have enough power because they don't have enough knowledge. Because a lot of things that you even talked about today in this room is just way above even my head and let alone of like regular people. So we have to get the meaningful informed consent before we start collecting the data of the users. And that is really difficult because we always think, but they cannot possibly understand what we are talking about. So we have to find a way to actually explain these things to them. Uh, we have to weigh the risks and benefits. Well, mostly they have risks and we have benefits. So we have to kind of balance that up. And um, we shouldn't be kind of um, tricked into saying, oh, but it's easy data to collect, why don't we just take that? Because the fact that it's easy doesn't mean that it is ethical. And, uh, and so also when you find somebody else's research and you think, really, is that what they did? Then you shouldn't just use it because, yeah, like you didn't do it, but they did it and then you use their results. Just uh, consider the ethics also in that case. And so these are the very detailed questions, like a, it's, a, it's a checklist that you have to follow if you want to create an ethical research yourself. And then there was a, a very specific work done for measuring the censorship on the internet. Um, and this paper was published, so uh, Ray Butlos is mentioned in this one, so that's why I listed here, because um, it turned out for some of these purposes the Ray Butlos is not the, the best solution. And then there was another research done last year 
which also <coughs> trying to use Red Atlas for measuring the internet disruptions. And again, for some purposes, it is a good match, and for some purposes, it's not a good match. And so if our goal would have been to be like the best possible product for measuring all these things, we wouldn't have reached that goal because we have changed our product to follow more ethical guidelines than just being the most useful product for certain of these messages. Now, let me just ask how many of you have heard about right battles before? Okay, not even half. So I will give a short introduction to that because it is a short talk. Um, first of all, RIPE NCC. We are a regional internet registry. We have one of the five regional internet registries in the world. That means we give out IP addresses and AS numbers to internet service providers and other companies in our region. Our region is this kind of yellow mustard color, Europe. Um, and so, in addition to that, we also, okay, so this is how the IP addresses distribution works. We get our addresses from the central registry, which is uh, IANA or ICANN, and then via the regional registry, we give them to local registries and then they give them to end users. And I mentioned IPv6, so that at least somebody would mention IPv6 today. <laughs> Okay, um, and so this is the, the RIPE Atlas. So I didn't bring one of these uh, devices, but uh, here is a picture. So it's a small router, uh, you connect it at home, and then it uh, does pings and trace routes to random places in the internet. And there is uh, about 10,000 of them uh, everywhere around the world. And so we collect the data and then we publish it again so anybody can have access to it. And so what does it do? Well, it's a very uh, low layer, but not as low as you were talking about today. So it's actually PIN, TraceRoute, DNS, TLS, NTP, and, and some HTTP. You can use uh, APIs or CLI tools, and we also have our own, own visualization. And so, uh, yeah, there are mostly ISPs are the users of this data and the researchers who want to see like global reachability of the internet addresses. And so, what did we do? So, when we were designing this uh, thing, okay, let me try it like this. So when we were designing RIP Atlas, so I say we because I kind of represent RIP NCC, but uh, actually it was my colleagues, um, we have decided to not listen to the existing traffic on the wire to protect the privacy of the users. So we generate pings. And so it's not even the actual measurement of the actual traffic that happens, but it's a measurement of pings. So some people can object to that, like, yeah, come on, it's not real traffic. Yeah, but at least we don't listen to the real traffic. Um, then we give these devices for free. Um, in a sense, they are for gratis for the users, but they are funded through the membership of the RIPE NCC. So people who want IP addresses, they have to pay membership fee. And, that, and since we are not for profit, we can't really like spend all that money on ourselves. So we, we invest in these kinds of projects that also benefit the members of the RIPE NCC. So the users don't have to pay for it. Anybody can afford to have the RIPE Atlas Pro. Um, the people who host this should be aware of what the risks are. So we try to get their consent and we hope that it is meaningful so that they know what they're doing. Uh, so we, um, on one hand, that's a good thing because we don't put them in the dangers that they didn't know about. On the other hand, our audience and people who volunteer for this are mostly geeks <coughs> because they know what this is. And we also do, cannot explain this to anybody else. So we have this kind of bias in the results that people who have good connectivity at home host the RIP Atlas Pro. So it looks like a lot of places are very well connected, but that's because we have this bias. Um, and we don't reveal the personal data of the hosts. We make all the tools uh, as free software and uh, as open data. 
and then we don't have a very elaborate set of measurements, as you could see. So uh, we do all this in order to protect people at their home and sometimes even cats at their home. And this is also a mandatory cat uh, picture in the slides. So it was quite difficult to get one where there is a cat and the rib atlas probe on the photo, but uh, we managed. So um, when we designed the system, the, the, the moral dilemmas didn't stop. So um, I was... Uh, I started working as a community builder, community manager, and then I was going to all these places where I usually go, like hackerspaces and hackers conferences. They were like, what? And where is the source code of this? I was like, well, you know, it's not really pretty and security. And they were like, no, 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 you have to actually like release the source code. So after a while, we did release the source code. Uh, then uh, we wanted for the ease of, of our ease and also like for some other ethical principles to say, okay, all the measurements have to be public because it's like funded by the public money and uh, transparency and so on. And then the people who actually took part in this, the community, they said, well, we want some of these measurements to actually not be public immediately because we want to kind of test new setup of our network and we don't want everybody to see like the, if things are going wrong. So then we couldn't implement that because the community who is actually creating this project together with us didn't want it. Um, and then in, uh, until that time also, a lot of people said, well, we also want web measurements. We want HTTP. And so we had a very big discussion about that with the community. And in the end, we decided not to implement HTTP measurements to random websites because that would put the users in danger because the, the concept of RIPE Atlas is I from Holland ask for the measurement from your probe in Italy to go to a website in Brazil. Now, I don't know uh, if that website is forbidden for the user from Italy and RIPE Atlas cannot know that. So we decided not to risk this and so actually we kind of uh, cut down the functionality of our platform for many, many users and many usages in order to not put the users in danger. Um, we also had a security audit and we, we had to fix some things and, uh, and we had to publish results for the transparency reasons. Um, and then uh, the, the IoT kind of became more and more of a buzzword and then we realized, well, we are also kind of an IoT device and we published more articles about how do we manage ripe Atlas devices as IoT devices with all kinds of security considerations but I'm not the right person to talk about that, so if you want the details, uh, there is a link to this article. And then finally, we also compared some measurements that are possible to kind of simulate the, the HTTP measurements, and apparently it's possible to get almost the same as HTTP get if you do some kind of TCP ping. So if you do want to test reachability and performance of your web server, you can do that using RIPE Atlas. It's just not as simple as to say do the web measurement, but it is possible. We described that in a, um, this article. There's also a webinar that uh, talks about how to do that. So another checklist for this ethical um, uh, thing specifically for the right Patla, so I will not repeat it. It's just there for documentation purposes. And finally, if you would like to become part of the RIPE community, we would welcome that. So you can always use our data, you can always use our tools, and please contribute the pull requests. Uh, you can find a lot of our tools on GitHub. And uh, soon we will have the fourth generation of the RIPE probe uh, available for distribution again. We also have a different device, which is called RIPE Atlas Anchor which is like a bigger server that you can keep somewhere closer to your infrastructure that does more measurements and it's also a target for the HTTP measurements. And so you can follow us on Twitter and uh, you can talk to me afterwards if you want uh, any more details. And uh, I want to finish with uh, the, the uh, kind of a message that I can't give you the answers, I can only give you more questions to your ethical uh, consideration. So always ask yourself, what are these technologies that you are building and influencing 
going to be used for, who is going to use them, who is going to benefit from them, and uh, what can they be used for uh, for the good, and how can they also be abused for the evil. Thank you very much. Thanks um, very much for this talk. Um, any questions? Comments? Thank you.